hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator. All right, welcome back to the next episode of the Just Law Podcast. I am Tom Blakely, your host. I am joined today by Peter Krause. He's an associate professor uh, at Boston College and the Morrissey College of Arts and Sciences. Uh, professor Krause's research and teaching focuses on international security, Middle East politics, terrorism, and political violence, nationalism, and rebels and revolution. He has recently published one book and two co-edited volumes, Rebel Power, Why National Movements Compete, Fight, and Win, uh, and Coercion, The Power to Hurt in International Politics, among other things. Uh, I reached out to Professor Krauss because uh, this, this is a, a topic, the topic we're going to be talking about today, uh, which I, I really couldn't think of anybody better to have uh, speak to this issue. The issue, of course, being uh, President Biden's uh, decision uh, very recently to withdraw all U.S. troops from Afghanistan by uh, September 11, 2021, the 20th anniversary of the September 11th attacks. Uh, this is obviously a, a very, very uh, considerable topic. And, you know, Professor Krauss having uh, extensive field work in the Middle East, teaching courses on Middle East uh, politics. Uh, as well as the uh, the, the issue of uh, U.S. operations at, at Tora Bora, which, I, as we'll get into today, um, you, you know, some of those events in the, the early phases of the of, of the war um, definitely, you know, play a major part in kind of you know the the, the course of what, what's taken place over the last twenty years. Which, uh, as as we know, President Biden has decided to uh, wind down by the end of this year. And obviously, this is something that has just been uh, a very uh, you know somber and, and and serious and costly uh, and important topic and this chapter in our nation's history. And so we'd like to do an episode uh, discussing this issue and, and, and to kind of discussing what uh, led us to where we are today. Professor Krauss, how are you? Thanks for coming on. I'm doing well. Thanks so much for having me, Tom. It's, a, it's an honor. I love, um, you know, engaging with the BC community. And obviously, as you say, this is a, a very serious but important issue. Uh, my senior year of college was when the 9-11 attacks happened. So I've been following, you know, this issue and this war for now the past 20 years from being a college student to a grad student to a professor. So, um, you know, I'm looking forward to talking about it. Awesome. Yeah. All right. So I, I guess we'll get started with just, you know, what's kind of hit the wire lately, which is President Biden has decided, you know, it's been uh, through the, the, as he said, two Republicans, two Democrats through the Bush administration, Obama and President Trump and now President Biden uh, have sort of, uh, you know, kind of passed this, this, this war along from one to the next. And he decided, um, you know, in, in his administration that, 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 that this is it. So I guess we'll just start with, you know, with, with that, which is how did President Biden ar arrive at this decision? Why, why do you think he decided to go this way at this time? Yeah, so I mean, I think you want to think a little bit about the phases of the Afghanistan war. Um, obviously, with the 9-11 attacks, the motivation for the war was to say, look, Afghanistan became a sanctuary for Al Qaeda to plan and launch, uh, you know, the deadliest terrorist attack in world history against the United States, and the deadliest attack in history on U.S. homeland. So the idea was to go and invade and topple this government, the Taliban, who had provided sanctuary to this terrorist organization. So despite their action, again, I remember this 20 years ago when I was in college, people said, oh, you know, the Soviets were in Afghanistan for years and it's not gonna be an easy fight. After some initial issues, the US basically wiped the Taliban out in a series of weeks. Uh, some of Bin Laden was on the radio to some of his guys around Tora Bora saying, I'm sorry, this is kind of not the way I planned things to go. So it was actually quite successful in that phase, but then came the next phase of saying, okay, you've toppled this government, but now can you help to build a stable uh, society and perhaps a democracy? There was a decent amount of enthusiasm and optimism among some individuals in those early phases, but by the mid 2000s, as the Taliban kind of came back and it obviously nation building and building a new democracy is a pretty difficult thing, especially from external intervention, that optimism kind of went away, but there was still some sense of, okay, we can get a strong Afghan government that will be able to prevent an overthrow by the Taliban. And so that was kind of the mid 2000s, early you know 2010s. And then you started to have, you know, under the Obama administration with Biden as vice president, Biden was actually one of those voices who was saying, you know what, this idea of nation building is really not the way to go. It's not going to be effective. He was advocating for a small force, maybe 1,500, 2,000 uh, for counterterrorism. So if we want to think about these objectives, it's kind of like highest level would be building a democracy and nation building. Next level would be strong government support and counterinsurgency. And then kind of the lowest level of presence is, you know, just have a small force there to do, um, you know, support for drone strikes or to go and do a snatch and grab or, you know, local security uh, protection of the government. And so Biden was advocating for that. But I think now at almost the 20 year mark, 
he's recognized that even having that force there has not really achieved that goal or does also to some extent Al Qaeda is obviously not the force it was before and so there's both the hopeful sense that maybe the Taliban would not host Al Qaeda in the same way as before maybe they still wouldn't be able to topple the current government but also to be honest the cost of this conflict the, the fact that it's the longest war in U.S. history and the fact that the United States has priorities elsewhere in East Asia and the Middle East I think it's all wrapped together to have the Biden administration decide it's time to go. Right. Oh, that's, that's great. And I think that, you know, you obviously know a lot about this topic. And I think that for, for a lot of folks, and you're right, this is the longest war in U.S. history. I think for a lot of people, I mean, I, uh, gosh, what was I, probably almost six years old when, when 9-11 happened. And you, you kind of see how, uh, you know, generations at this point have, 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 have fought uh, in Afghanistan of, you know, American service members and obviously a coalition of, of, of many nations who have, you know, sent, uh, you know, lives and dollars and, and, and time and, and just so much that's been poured into a very distressed part of the world. You know, obviously the Afghan people have uh, suffered as, 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 as much as anyone in, the, in, in this conflict and it's just gone on for so long that uh, I, I think it's reasonable to say that a lot of the individual you know, sort of pivotal decisions along the way start to kind of fall by the wayside. So I'd say it's kind of like to zoom in uh, and, and kind of focus on some of those decisions, which, you know, like you said, the, the and initially this was a very successful war. The Taliban was uh, ousted in short order. Um, and then, you know, 20 years happened. So I'd like to just zoom in on, on, I guess I'll go a little bit out of order here, just to focus on some of those early, you know, d d decisions that I, th I think just proved, um, you know, so, so, so pivotal. So um, I, I think the first thing I'd want to ask is, you know, obviously you have, you know, in, in, in late 2001, you know, that the Taliban, you know, into, into early 2002, the Taliban is, is, is toppled from power. Uh, you know, the, the, you know, basically the primary objectives of, of the, the invasion are accomplished. And then you enter, you know, as we've had over the last 20 years, this, this counterinsurgency, which is, is obviously something that's very, you know, difficult for the U S to manage, whether it's Afghanistan or, or Iraq or anywhere else, it's, it's something that, uh, you know, can, can be quite vexing, but I guess looking uh, at, at some of those early decisions. So the uh, U.S. early on uh, in the war sends, and you can, I'm sure, speak to this much uh, more thoroughly than I can, um, you, you know, in essence sends, you know, a, a light force, the CIA, uh, Operation Jawbreaker, um, you, you know, uh, goes in, airstrikes, you know, Lincoln with the, uh, you know, sort of links up with the Northern Alliance, you know, the, there's sort of this delay before, you know, the, the, the main invasion, um, you know, special forces do a lot of the heavy lifting early on, um, but you essentially have, you know, what happened, which is, you know, the, the, the Taliban and uh, bin Laden and others were able to flee into Pakistan. You know, I, I think if I remember correctly, and I'm sure you can speak to this more than I can, that, um, you know, some thought that, you know, perhaps more troops should be sent, there should be more uh, of an effort to, 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 to stop that, you know, there, there should have been more resources at Tora Bora, um, and, and those things didn't happen, and things obviously went the way that they did. So I, I guess I would just ask, looking at those early decisions, whether that's uh, Secretary Rumsfeld at the time or, or the, whoever the decision makers were, um, that, 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 that sort of had a, had a, had a role uh, in, in that and sort of allowing um, you know, the Taliban to regroup in Pakistan, which I, I would say sort of set in motion what happened over you know, the, the succeeding years. Like, I guess what, what happened in that late 2001, early 2002? How did those decisions turn and why did things go the way they did? Sure. So this debate about military footprint isn't new. So what is being debated now, and again, it seems like Biden has answered that debate by saying we're going to have every single U.S. Uh, soldier out of the country. Uh, but again, there are some who are saying, well, keep a force of 1,500, et cetera. These were similar debates to what was happening at the beginning of the war, where some people were saying, oh, it's going to take 100,000 troops, can take 200,000 troops. But Rumsfeld um, and others were really in support of the idea of kind of this lighter footprint with the you know, concern that, hey, either having large numbers of U.S. troops can generate animosity. So there's this argument that, you know, having foreign occupying military forces can lead to either terrorist attacks or, you know, anti-U.S. feeling. Also, just the idea of, well, once you have these large numbers of troops in there, you're kind of in there potentially doing nation building or things of this nature that people don't want in addition to the cost of it. So there was something called the Afghan model. And in fact, this was the first uh, peer reviewed academic article that I published was based on this whole scenario where the United States government basically partnered, as you say, 
in U.S. intelligence assets on the ground, along with you know what was called the Northern Alliance and you know, Eastern Alliance, basically these anti-Taliban forces that were in Afghanistan that were kind of the foot soldiers, coupled with the U.S. Air Force, you know the best Air Force in the world, and certainly against the Taliban, which had basically no Air Force to speak of, pretty dominant on the battlefield. And so that combination led to basically a rollback of the Taliban with no U.S. battlefield casualties for the first couple months of the war. So this was seen as like a smashing success, a model for kind of warfare or potentially counterinsurgency going forward because you can partner what the U.S. does best but also pay attention to kind of the American public's desire to have minimal American casualties and nonetheless defeat you know an enemy like the Taliban you're not going to defeat uh, you know modern industrialist army like that but an army like the Taliban you could so that was the first part but then as I wrote about in my article there are some weaknesses with that and one of the weaknesses is if you're trying to do counterterrorism or capture and kill certain individuals like certainly the U.S. was with Osama bin Laden he slipped through the U.S. net at Tora Bora so that's this massive cave complex in eastern Afghanistan, uh, you know, not that far from, from Kabul in some sense, if you look at a map, but, you know, right on the border with Pakistan. And this was where bin Laden had, you know, had operated a bit during the war against the Soviets. And so he had kind of planned the 9-11 attacks as being what we call in, you know, kind of terrorism literature as being a strategy of provocation. So he didn't believe that hitting the U.S. on 9-11 was just going to lead to the United States crumple and die. In some sense, he wanted to draw the U.S. into Afghanistan because he believed in his mind that al-Qaeda and the uh, Mujahideen had ground down the world's second superpower, the Soviet Union in Afghanistan. And so he thought that they could do it again with the Americans. Of course, that's not what happened uh, in the sense that number one, he was not able to stave off the US at Tora Bora. In fact, he had to flee into Pakistan and was only barely able to do so. Again, it's a little sketchy in terms of what's publicly available, but it seems like he slipped through, paid some people off, et cetera. And so this Afghan model that the US relied on wasn't working perfectly because in some sense there were local you know, Afghanistan troops on the ground who are anti-Taliban, anti-Al-Qaeda, but then they are also just been bought off by the Americans, and so they could then be bought off by bin Laden thereafter, whereas if you had U.S. forces on the ground, they're not going to let bin Laden, you know, slip through the net, especially in the months after 9-11. So that's what I wrote my article about, was basically to say, could the U.S. have had a rapid reaction force from 82nd Airborne or some of these other U.S. forces that can deploy quickly, and I basically argued that they could have. One of the reasons that they didn't was because in Rumsfeld's mind and George W. Bush's mind and some other leaders' mind, uh, basically the war in Afghanistan had been won. And so now they felt like Iraq was the next thing that they had their eye on. And so they didn't want to send larger numbers of troops into Afghanistan because they were already focused on selling and potentially prosecuting the war in Iraq. And so that was one of the other, you know, initial kind of political debating points of did the United States let bin Laden get away because they took their eye off the ball there. So that's kind of the first phase. And then the next little part is, you know, the Taliban is, is basically kicked out of Afghanistan. Uh, they're in shambles to some extent. And it's not something where there's a robust Taliban insurgency in 2002, 2003. It's really like 2004, 5, 6, when they start to come, you know, back to the fore as a significant force, of course, with the support of Pakistan and, and some of their other foreign backers. But in that broad sense, there was this period in the aftermath of the toppling of the Taliban, which again, people were pleasantly surprised at how quickly it happened, where there was felt like there was a real chance. You didn't just have the US there, you had NATO there because they had invoked Article 5. And so you had other foreign forces there. And there was a sense of, okay, the Taliban's gone. The Afghan people have dealt with decades of civil conflict that's destroyed their country and that now maybe a better future can be built. And so if you want to look back at an opportunity when the Taliban was mostly a spent and not significant force, it's kind of those first few years after 2001 and efforts were certainly made. Uh, it wasn't for lack of resources, but because of some of the natural problems of building a strong centralized government in Afghanistan, the various warring factions and tribes and you know foreign actors who have different interests there, et cetera, um, unfortunately, it wasn't able to happen. Right. Uh, and focusing on that, you know, for, for, for a moment, I, I know the Iraq issue is obviously something uh, that I want to hit upon. But, uh, you know, I, I guess that decision and you brought up Pakistan, which which is important. We can talk about that, too. Um, I remember reading and I might be mistaken that, that there was a belief among, uh, you know, the Bush administration at the time that, that Pakistan might even, uh, you know, arrest, you know, uh, figures like bin, you know, that might not, uh, you know, well, if they flee to Pakistan, you know, it's, it's not the biggest deal. And obviously, Pakistan has, uh, you know, played, you know, something of a, of a role in, you know, supporting, you know, at times, maybe not, you know, uh, very strongly, but at least, you might say, turn a blind eye, you know, I think Pakistan has been, 
um, somewhat, uh, you know, ha has had something of a role. Um, and I'm sure you can speak to this more than, more than I can in, you know, perhaps not, um, I guess being as honest as, as, as they could have been, you know, at least early on in the war. I mean, after all, I think, uh, you know, bin Laden was, uh, killed, uh, in Abbottabad in Pakistan. Uh, I think near a, a Pakistani military base, if I remember that fact correctly. And so there's obviously some, you can kind of scrutinize, um, some of the relationships that are there, but that, um, decision at the time, you know, it's, it's a not, go big, you know, to, to, to not dedicate too many uh, resources, uh, to not perhaps, you know, uh, seek a deal with the, I mean, the Taliban, you know, they, they sort of admitted defeat, you know, they, they laid down their arms pretty early on there, the US could have uh, made some kind of deal, some kind of armistice or, or something to figure out what would happen going forwards. Do you think that that would have you know, had the U.S. decided things differently, you can always, you know, hindsight's always twenty twenty. But do you think, you know, doing things differently and saying, you know, trying to come to the table, and, and obviously, I, I think not only not to to put too much blame at the feet of the administration at the time, but I think the American people generally were not in any frame of mind to want to, you know, make a deal with Al Qaeda or the Taliban or any of these groups. But do you think that, you know, trying to to come to the table then after the Taliban had been defeated, and instead of trying to, you know, prosecute this counterinsurgency that went on for twenty years, would have made the conflicts go differently or perhaps more successfully? Or, or do you think that no matter what, what happened, you know, the, the Taliban was gonna come back and insurgency was, was inevitable? Good question. So first I'll say you raised an important point that I think it's important for everyone to understand, which is, you know, the mindset of the country at the time, which again, I remember very well, it was a very patriotic time in the United States and there was real anger. I mean, you know, again, this had been the deadliest attack in US history. And it was in, you know, landmarks and places that, you know, resonated with many Americans, right? I mean, Washington, D.C., uh, the Pentagon, obviously the World Trade Center, and then the, the bravery of people on Flight 93 who took that flight down that maybe was headed for the U.S. Uh, capital. Um, so there was a feeling of, you know, you're with us, you're against us, right? These were basically the words of President Bush. Uh, you know, Colin Powell, I believe, saying things like, look, history starts today. So whatever your relationship has been in the past with the Taliban or whatever else, like, we're going to judge you now and you're either on our side or on the enemy side. And so you're right that I think the American people were not in a, you know, negotiating mood at the time. It wasn't a mood of, hey, our, either our deterrence has been degraded or, you know, it's time for revenge or, you know, justice, however you want to frame it. So I think that there's some truth to that. But I'll also say this. It's not that the US didn't try in terms of engaging with Pakistan or otherwise. I think that the challenge really is that Pakistan sees having strategic depth in Afghanistan as being, you know, borderline an existential need for their country because of the rivalry they have with India or other countries in the region. And so they look at it and say, look, a lot of like Pakistan, of course, is not a unitary actor. They have regions of their country that border Afghanistan that have been somewhat lawless or tough to control for quite a while. And so they see it as a real problem. I mean, imagine if on the US border, there's all this debate about what's happening on the border with Mexico. Okay, imagine if in, instead of that, you know, Texas and Southern Arizona and whatnot were basically not really controlled by the federal government. And then over the border in Mexico was, you know, ongoing civil war for 30 years and that would bleed into the US. I mean, it would be a real, the US would take it even more seriously than it does now. And so that's kind of the situation with Pakistan. And so, you know, the US obviously had a big interest in Afghanistan to get rid of bin Laden and Al Qaeda. And obviously there was a push against the Taliban for being a brutal regime and what they did to you know, the, the society there, especially women and, and otherwise. But, um, you know, at the end of the day, Pakistan is just not going anywhere, right? This whole debate, this discussion we're having now is about whether the US is going to pull out. Pakistan is never going to pull away from Afghanistan. It's always going to border the country. It's always going to have a strong interest there. And if you go back to the history of it, you're right. You know, Pakistan was a US ally during the Cold War. Again, everyone and I think knows this, but when we go back to the previous war in Afghanistan against the Soviets, you know, Pakistan was the US's main ally that was helping to support the various rebel groups there to fight against the Soviets. So basically those connections that were built during that time period formed a lot of the basis for Pakistan's continued involvement and meddling in Afghan affairs. And I just don't think that's ever going to stop. So the US used threats, the US used carrots, a variety of things with the Pakistani government. But at the end of the day, whether it's certain elements in the ISI, the Pakistani intelligence services or other members of the military, otherwise, they're just not going to abandon their desire to play in Afghan politics. And to be fair, I don't think the United States would either. I mean, the United States Monroe Doctrine was not just playing in our neighbor's politics. It was saying basically this whole hemisphere is our, our sandbox and don't come into it. And so I think there was just a balance of will and interest there that wasn't going to be resolved, even though the U.S. tried. Do I think the United States and its allies could maybe have done better during that time period to help build up 
a more effective Afghan government. Yeah, but at the same time, like there were massive amounts of resources in there. You've got challenges trying to work uh, with Karzai, who you know was not necessarily the leader in the, the ways that the U.S. had hoped for, but again, also just the challenge of being a foreign force trying to again meddle in Afghani politics and and make it you know maybe in line with an American vision. That, that's a very difficult thing to achieve. So, you know, I think the counterfactual discussion is worthwhile. But given the very difficult facts on the ground and the fact that Afghanistan has not really had a strong centralized government due to challenges of geography, challenges of socioeconomic development, et cetera, um, I think the idea of having a stable democratic Afghanistan being built by the United States and NATO during that period is probably a very difficult task to achieve regardless of the strategy that was used. Great. And I guess just to, just to circle back a little bit, I mean, what is your, you know, sort of, sort of confidence in whether it was uh, a deal that was struck, you know, in, in late 2001 or 2002 or whenever, or even, you know, last year or, you know, in 2019 and 20, when the, the Trump administration was having talks uh, with the Taliban to try to secure some kind of deal that, you know, a lot of people look at that and say, okay, well, the Taliban is not going to live up to their word, you know, Al Qaeda will come right back. And, you know, whether it was at the beginning of this or, or in the last couple of years, what is your confidence that, you know, had, you know, and you, you know, you spoke about the counterfactual, just to indulge the counterfactual, uh, you know, briefly, uh, that, that had, you know, a, a deal been reached with the Taliban that, you know, that that deal would 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 be solid, that Al Qaeda just wouldn't come back. And, you know, as soon as the US leaves, things just would go back to the way that they were, as opposed to doing what's happening now, where there's no deal and the US is just leaving, deciding that there's other, you know, there's bigger fish to fry. Yeah. So look, I, I've, I've seen the outpouring on, you know, social media or on, on regular media from, you know, American service members and veterans who served in these, you know, this war, many, many tours in some cases, and, you know, some of them questioning, like, what was it all for and what, you know, what happened as a result of it. And I, I think those are fair questions. You know, first of all, no one wants to be the last casualty in a war, but even beyond that, you want to struggle and fight and put resources into something that you hope is successful. Um, let alone, obviously, the many Afghans who fought and died in this conflict to try to make a better life for themselves and their country. Um, so I will say if there's one positive that maybe has come out of this conflict, um, it might be a strong signaling, a, what we would call in political science, costly signaling to the Taliban that, look, maybe the U.S. is willing to deal with the fact that the Taliban is going to be part of this country going forward. And ultimately, that's going to be decided by the Afghan people. Um, but if the Taliban starts to provide sanctuary again to Al Qaeda or ISIS or any of these other jihadi groups that are now going to plan and try to uh, launch strikes on American interests or the American homeland, that you know the United States hasn't said we'll never go back in or we'll never go and hit you again with you know air power or otherwise. And so I think that that message is probably received by the Taliban much more than it was in 2001. Uh, again, going back to that time period, you know President Bush did talk about hey the Taliban like give up bin Laden and the Taliban basically said, no, they were kind of like, well, we need to see more evidence about his actual guilt for the 9-11 attack. So it wasn't like these types of things were on the table then. The Taliban ultimately kind of made a calculation. They had some later criti criticized self-criticism on about not kind of breaking with Al Qaeda in bin Laden. But again, bin Laden had given them a lot of money, had worked with them on infrastructure. So, you know, they used this whole thing about, oh, he's a guest and we don't want to, you know, break, you know, our politeness, uh, et cetera. But that was mostly obviously a cover for the the fact that they felt like it was in their interest to work with him and they didn't necessarily think the U.S. was going to come in the way that it did and, and do what it did thereafter. So if I'm the Taliban these days, I may be a bit more chastened by that and feel like, look, if I can just try to reconquer or control significant parts of this country, but not host transnational jihadis who are going to hit the U.S., I'm probably going to be mostly left alone. And so there's no guarantee that that's the choice they're going to make, but I think there's a chance that they will. And, you know, the, the past 20 years of them, you know, paying significant costs themselves in terms of this conflict might, you know, change their calculus from what it was in 2000, 2001. Right. Uh, now, you know, going off of that, you know, four administrations now uh, have sort of tried to figure out, you know, an, an end game in Afghanistan only to, you know, have, uh, you know, sort of the, the you know, military and intelligence community, you know, sort of uh, convince, uh, you know, the, the, the president that, no, we have to stay, you know, President Obama, uh, you know, ultimately uh, had a troop surge, you know, at the beginning of his uh, administration, President Trump. Uh, also was, was, was skeptical of the war and wanted to leave, but was ultimately convinced that, uh, you know, by, by uh, you know, by, by the you know, military, by, by uh, leadership there that, you know, that the U.S. needed to remain in the country. And uh, obviously all reports are that President Biden was hearing the same things, but he decided that, no, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm pulling the plug on this. What, what makes th this different? What makes it different now that, you know, in 2021, 20 years later, 
Um, you know, obviously, there's some s- symbolism with the with the date, uh, the, the 20th anniversary of the of the attacks so of that sort of being the deadline. What makes it different now that you know, the, the president, you know, not only that it's a different president, but just overall that uh, that, that, that this is the time that the president has finally said no enough. Yeah, good question. So I think there's three elements, um, and I'll go to them honestly in order of significance, reverse order. So this is maybe the least significant stuff, though it matters. Um, I do think that like the facts on the ground matter, and the fact that there was some initial optimism in those early years that these, you know, pretty audacious objectives of a stable, centralized, decently powerful Afghanistan government, let alone a democratic one, could be achieved. And obviously. You know, the optimism for that went away over time as, you know, despite pouring in of resource and attempts to do this, it was not as successful. Now, to be fair, democracies and stable centralized governments in a country like Afghanistan that's faced decades of conflict, let alone challenging geography, foreign neighbors, etc., don't emerge overnight. If you want to look again at successful attempts at, you know, foreign imposed democratization, people always, of course, go back to Germany and Japan after World War II, countries in which the United States still has troops in and around, you know, 70, 80 years later. Um, But that being said, if you also went back to the history of Germany and Japan, and you look 20 years after the World War II, the countries weren't necessarily doing perfectly, but economically and democratically, they were doing uh, a bit better than Afghanistan is. Now, again, they started from a better position, but so there's some of that. Um, The second thing I'll say is, look, the military and the intelligence service, I have tremendous respect for them. And I think that the way that they're structured and the ethos that they have is, you know, you give them a mission and they're going to plan as hard as they can to try to execute that mission. And it's in their DNA and their nature to not give up and to try to find a way to make this happen. And so, you know, whether it's the metrics that they're assessing that are kind of these tactical ones of saying, look, we achieved this small thing, which is this will bubble up or whatever, you know, you're rarely going to have the military say, we can't do this. You know, that's not what they're designed to do. They're designed to get a mission from our civilian leaders to say, look, this is what we want to achieve. And even if the civilians say, look, we're giving you a thousand troops to do this, the military will say, okay, you know, we'll give it a try, even though they'll lobby for more, they'll lobby for more resources. So I'm not surprised that the military, you know, kind of like a pit bull wants to hold on and keep trying to fight in this sense, because, you know, they're the last group that wants to admit defeat or that they haven't been able to accomplish something, even if they feel like they haven't gotten the resources or whatever else they need to, to achieve it. But to be honest here, I don't think you can anno- ignore the domestic politics angle about, you know, each of these decisions. So you mentioned President Obama surging in Afghanistan. A lot of that was because he wanted to pull out of Iraq and felt like Iraq was not going so well, similar to some of these debates we have in Afghanistan, but he was very concerned, especially as a democratic president, of looking quote unquote weak, especially amidst the war on terror, which was still near its height at that time. And so the idea was pull out of Afghanistan to fight the right war or the good war, excuse me, pull out of Iraq to fight the right war, or the good war in Afghanistan. And so just as the Bush administration had maybe taken their eye a little bit off the ball, getting bin Laden and focused on Iraq, now Obama was swinging back the other way, pulling out of Iraq and then surging into Afghanistan. So I think that that explains a lot of that time period. By the time you get to Trump, I think that in his nature, and again, he's a little all over the map because on the one hand, he's like, America's gonna have the biggest, strongest military ever, but at the same time, he's pulling, wants to pulling back from a lot of these places he considers quagmires or otherwise, which some would say makes America look weak, but again, it's kind of a mixed bag. But I think ultimately, the concern about him being the one who lost Afghanistan, right? This is the way American politics talks about this stuff. It's like, who lost China when China went communist? Who lost whatever country, Vietnam? Um, That plays a big role in presidential decision-making. And so in the early years after 9-11, no one's gonna leave at that point. But over the past decade, anyone could have left. And they all kind of started pushing in that direction. Obama ended Operation Enduring Freedom in 2014. So basically said, look, we're no longer doing this massive effort. Now it's more of a counterterrorism effort. So that kind of took us down a peg. Then Trump got to the point of saying, I think I want us to withdraw and set a date, although didn't do it in his time. And now with Biden, there's no way he's going to, I think, surge up. So it's pretty much keep at this very low level or end it. And I think at the end of the day, since Biden's preferences were always in this direction, and also as a Democratic president, um, they're a little bit more willing to do this stuff. The Republicans are ones who are more typically kind of the gung-ho, patriotic, don't make America look weak kind of thing. So it's a bigger step for a Republican to kind of end a conflict, I think, in this environment. And you see with Biden making this decision, even though the American people support it overwhelmingly, and even though a majority of Republican voters uh, support it, it's slight, but I think I saw a poll was about 52% and a higher percentage of Democrats, you're still gonna see Mitch McConnell and Republican senators, others being like, this is a bad idea, this makes America look weak, for the most part, except for some people like Ron Paul, 
Why? Because it scores political points. You know, even though President Biden has had pretty much nothing to do with the course of Afghanistan over the past few months relative to the past 20 years, um, it's still going to be hung on him a bit by some in some quarters that he lost Afghanistan. And if victory wasn't around the corner, at least counterterrorism was. And so if we then see the Taliban topple the Afghan government, or if we see the spread of Al Qaeda or ISIS affiliated groups inside the country, trust me, that criti criticism will come most at the president who kind of left, just as it did with Obama and the rise of ISIS in Iraq. So that I think at this point is playing a bigger, bigger part of the calculus than necessarily the facts on the ground, which people are looking at and saying, they're not getting that much better despite years of resources put in. So, you know, it's time to go and focus elsewhere. Right. Uh, I just want to go back to something that we kind of mentioned early on uh, and then speak about, you know, some of these later issues, you know, the, the Iraq uh, parallels and, you know, some of the President Obama's decision making and, you know, what might happen with Afghanistan. But going back uh, to Iraq, I mean, I guess you'd have to go back to, I mean, you can go back a very long time. I mean, the, the conflicts in these parts of the world are, you know, nothing new, unfortunately. But um, the, the decision of the Bush administration specifically, um, with regard to Iraq to, 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 you know, I mean, you can get into all the arguments about WMD and, and all that, but I don't really think that that's part of the, the at least this conversation necessarily, but um, you know, President Bush's father, President HW Bush, obviously uh, with the, with, you know, with the Gulf War decided to uh, push uh, the Iraqi army back out of Kuwait, but not necessarily topple uh, Saddam Hussein and not do uh, you know, what, what happened, uh, you know, some uh, you know, decade or so later. Um, and President Bush did. You know, whether you want to talk about WMD or, or you know, uh, the, you know, terrorism or you know, uh, the oppressive regime or human rights abuse, I mean, whatever you know, justification you want to use. Um, obviously, you know, once that regime was toppled, you had insurgency, you had AQI, you had ICE. I mean, you had all these offshoots of all these different terror organizations that, you know, kind of uh, whether it's Ramadi or, or other areas of the country. Um, the insurgency that sort of dominated that 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 decade in Iraq, I guess you could say. Um, was avoidable. The U.S. did not need to invade Iraq. It was obviously a war that had significant opposition, both in this country and other countries. But um, again, looking to the counterfactual, if the U.S. decided that, and, and you know, it was you know well known at the time that the evidence from the intelligence community with regard to you know Saddam Hussein's weapons program was were not particularly airtight. Um, if the administration decided instead, okay, you know what, Iraq, you know, we're, we're, it's it's not there. You know, we're we're not, not going to. You know, there's no evidence on 9/11, WMT, whatever. It's just not it's not worth it. They just decide not to invade Iraq, and those resources are, are, are focused on um, Afghanistan. And, and you know, it, it, as you had mentioned, you know, even before the war in Iraq, you know, decision makers were already thinking about um, the road ahead. I, you know, I, I know it's sort of well known at this point that following 9/11, you know, one of Donald Rumsfeld's first notes was, you know, look for connections with Iraq. You know, it was already on the minds of um, you, you know, many uh, immediately after the attack. But um, if if the U.S. decided to to not invade Iraq and, and everything was all all eyes were focused on Afghanistan, do you think that the the course of the war would have changed, or is this just uh, a country whose its politics, its people, um, for for generations now have, have you know, very tragically been just em, em, embroiled in civil war and in conflict? I mean, how much does the Iraq decision ultimately affect the calculus of? what happened in Afghanistan in the, in the two decades that, that followed. Yeah, look, I can't pretend that I have a crystal ball, so I can't tell you exactly what would have happened or, or close to it, but I will say this. If you want to set up the best possible scenario for greater success in Afghanistan, it would involve the following things. Um, not having the Iraq war, um, putting you know more U.S. troops in to potentially capture or kill bin Laden, which would take more of the wind out of the sails of al-Qaeda um, right then and there. Um, and then put the resources, again, the massive amount of economic and military resources that went to Iraq, at least some of them into Afghanistan, that's the best scenario for success. And I do believe that things would have gone better in Afghanistan if that had been the choices that were made, although I can't say it would have been necessarily a, a massive nation building or democratic success, but I think it would have been better. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that the feeling among the Bush administration, as is well documented, was yeah, Afghanistan was great. We're glad we got this quick, cheap victory, at least what it seemed at the time. But they really didn't feel like that that reestablished the American deterrent who had just taken a big body blow with the 9-11 attack. So knocking out someone like Saddam was a much bigger deal than going after the Taliban, let alone all the other issues that Saddam tied into from U.S. interests to, you know, interests of allies in the regions 
uh, so to speak. So in that broad sense, um, yeah, many people would suggest that the Iraq war is maybe the most momentous event in the region over the past couple of decades because what it did to, you know, kind of start this era of these major civil wars and instability in the region that kept, you know, spread to various other areas that helped to create, as you say, um, the most prolific terrorist group in the past, you know, 20 years or so of ISIS in terms of numbers of attacks and some of the brutality that they did. So, yeah, it's a massive, um, massive decision that had far-reaching effects in the region. Um, also, as you say, kind of indirect effects in terms of resources and attention put into Afghanistan. Um, and yeah, I mean, it, it, as you say, it's not something that at the time everyone thought was great. If you People will lie a bit and say that they were all against it. If you look at the American public, the majority of the American public supported the Iraq war. But I will also say at the time, um, I was a grad student um, at, well, I was a high school teacher and then soon after I was a grad student in the early phases. And you know, my mentors at MIT had taken out full page ads in the New York Times uh, talking about why this was a really bad idea and basically predicting exactly what would happen. Now, again, they're not dovish people in the sense that these are security studies professors who study war and conflict and uh, try to understand why it happens and ultimately you know, try to help prevent it. But at the same time, you know, these are people who have served in um, you know, various governments or otherwise, and they know the ins and outs of, of military uh, behavior and action and, and operations. But you know, ultimately they predicted, hey, this is going to lead to instability. The United States can topple Saddam pretty easily, but doesn't know what's next, doesn't have a good plan for it. It's going to lead to all these problems. And that's unfortunately exactly what happened. So um, yeah, I don't think you can underestimate the impact of the Iraq war on things that we're still experiencing to this day in the Middle East and in you know parts of Central Asia like Afghanistan. Right. Uh, just looking at one more rear view mirror topic and then just, you know, sort of finishing with uh, where things stand today. And I, and I know this is something you, you know, you saw, I saw your, your article on, 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 on Tora Bor and on, on Bin Laden. So Bin Laden, obviously, um, is a major figure in all of this, you know, from, from the, I mean, even to, you know, the, the, the decades before the attacks until his uh, death in 2011. Um, I, I guess, you know, one way of looking at this is, you know, throughout 20 years in Afghanistan and the Middle East, you know, the, the U.S. has, you know, sort of cut off the heads of, of many different snakes in terms of whether it's airstrikes or other means eliminating the leaders of a lot of these terror groups. And ultimately, somebody else comes in, somebody else is, you know, brought up and these terror groups continue to perpetuate themselves. Um, I know there's a lot of emphasis on, well, you know, as we spoke about, if the U.S. had more forces in, in place, put more of an emphasis on bin Laden, put more of an emphasis on, you know, sort of cutting off that uh, Taliban uh, evacuation. Like, let's say bin Laden was killed. Do you, do you, and I know you use the term, you know, demoralized. I mean, do, do you really believe that um, Al Qaeda, the, the Taliban, that that would have, um, you know, changed the, the, the course of the war, maybe caused, you know, the, 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 the group to, to, to come apart from within? Or do you believe that somebody else would just be put in his place and the thing would go on as it, as it has every time, you know, uh, al you know, any of these other leaders that have been killed uh, in an airstrike or a drone or whatever it is? I mean, the U.S. has dropped, I don't know how many tons of ordnance on these people, and yet they continue to prop up new people in their place and they continue to go on. But do you, do you think that if bin Laden had been killed earlier on, that would have changed the course? Or would this just have gone the way of these other killings where somebody else just comes in and take their place? It's a good question. And it's one of the questions that actually we have a great deal of scholarship to help answer. So there's a whole, you know, for your listeners or the viewers here, you want to look into this, just, you know, Google or Google Scholar decapitation strikes, you know, counterinsurgency or terrorism, you'll find people like Jenna Jordan uh, at um, Georgia Tech, you'll find people like Austin Long, a former colleague of mine at MIT who now is at RAND. You'll find people like Patrick Johnson also at RAND. They've done extensive, you know, in-depth case studies and statistical analysis of decapitation strikes and the impact that it has on these types of organizations. But like many things in the world, um, it's nuanced. So sometimes decapitation strikes do take out uh, terror and insurgent organizations. Other times they don't. It has to do with a couple of things. One is, you know, Dan Byman talks about like how deep is the bench to use a sports analogy. So basically, the longer organization is around and the more it's developed a strong cadre of leaders, you kill one, there's others that can easily replace it that will have that greater you know, degree of legitimacy, experience, et cetera, won't really take the organization out. But the younger that it is, the more likely it can take them out. Also, there can be unique characteristics of certain leaders. And this is where I think Al-Qaeda falls into. And to be honest, we're seeing some of that counterfactual today with Zawahri, who may himself be dead, but nonetheless, what his leadership was like versus bin Laden. So people don't always know this, but Al-Qaeda, um, it was not a single cohesive organization. It was a basically 
a, an alliance of multiple jihadi organizations that came together um, basically in 1988 at the end of the war against the Soviets. And it was a unique organization in the sense of what bin Laden brought to it. So Zawahiri was a longer time jihadi who had the cred that bin Laden didn't uh, about fighting for this broader cause, but he didn't have the resources that bin Laden did. Bin Laden had the wealth. And so bin Laden also had the strategic decision-making to say, what I wanna do is to fight the far enemy the United States and the West and get them out of the Middle East first before we then try to topple the near enemy, which is all these local uh, quote unquote Muslim governments that bin Laden didn't think were true Muslims. Um, and so in that broader sense, bin Laden had you know, both charisma as an individual and as a speaker, but also the wealth and also kind of the unifying ability to bring some of these disparate factions together and help to mold and build this transnational jihadi organization, which he had started to do during the war against the Soviets in Afghanistan. So Wahari had the credibility and the experience of being a jihadi, but he's not nearly the charismatic leader that bin Laden was. He came from an Egyptian faction that made it harder for him to branch out and have legitimacy with a number of others. There were some tensions, people can go back and read, between him and what was originally Al-Qaeda in Iraq later becomes ISIS under Baghdadi. Uh, excuse me, not Baghdadi, under Zarqawi. Um, and so you can see some of the split there. And I think some of it has to do with the fact that ultimately Zawahiri is not respected to the degree that bin Laden was to the point that when some of these groups are taking allegiances to Al Qaeda, they're taking allegiances to bin Laden as an individual. And when he dies, they break some of them. So even at that later stage, you know, bin Laden being killed had an impact on Al Qaeda's fortunes. In 2001, if there had been this hit of, yes, Al Qaeda had been around at that point for over a decade, but it really was only doing major attacks for about five years in, up to that point. If they had knocked out the Taliban, taken control of Afghanistan, killed bin Laden, and if they killed bin Laden, there's a decent chance they would have killed a number of other major Al Qaeda leaders along with him with that group that was at Tora Bora. Um, that may not have been a fully debilitating strike to Al Qaeda, but it would have significantly changed the trajectory of the group, I think. And so if we wanna again do the, the perfect scenario of having that happen and then not starting the Iraq war, which gave the fuel for Al Qaeda to reinvigorate itself on the grievances and the tensions that were um, spurred up by that conflict. Yeah, I think you see a very different transnational jihadi movement uh, and Al Qaeda movement today, but unfortunately those things didn't happen. Right. Uh, and one more question on, on bin Laden, which I, I just sort of thought of, you know, and it's, it's just such a, the, the history of this conflict of this country, it, there's just so much that, that, that you can say. I, I guess one thing uh, to point out that I think, you know, not a lot of people are familiar with, I, you know, bin Laden had been around, he was known. I mean, it, it was not that 9-11 happened, which was a surprise and a tragedy in so many ways, but the bin Laden and Al-Qaeda Al and their capabilities were, were, were known. I mean, I, I guess no one really predicted, you know, what ended up happening on September 11th. But uh, in the 1990s, uh, you know, President Clinton was, you know, I, I believe in, I'm sure you can speak to this a little bit more than I can, you know, offered the opportunity to, uh, by the CIA, I believe, to, to eliminate bin Laden. I mean, this guy was on the radar screen, um, for sure. I mean, you, you look at some of the, the attacks in, in Africa and other things that had happened um, within the 1990s, but decided not to, uh, you know, there, there were certain strikes, but, but nothing particularly strong against um, bin Laden. And I, and I guess, you know, in your mind as, you know, Americans and uh, I think just as people, you know, you, you tend to think back and think about counterfactuals and, oh, if we only could have done this, we should have, should have done that. Um, why did, why was U.S. policy in the 1990s not more proactive about bin Laden, about Al-Qaeda, and maybe a little bit, um, I, I guess naive isn't probably the proper terminology, but um, maybe not trying to stamp out the threat at a, at a time where it would have been Maybe not, you know, perhaps easier, but also a more um, uh, a time when maybe there, there should have been more action and there was not. Why was the Clinton administration more averse to taking a stronger stand on, on Al Qaeda when it was very clearly becoming what it it, it ultimately was sure. was yeah. and was capable of doing? Well, look, there, you're right. And there was this era, you know, like Peter Bergen from CNN would like go and interview Bin Laden. And again, it wasn't something he just walked over there. They had to, you know, go and be hooded and be kept somewhere or whatever. But I mean, you could access him. Um, I'll say a couple of things. First is you have to remember as always, like policymakers think through, you know, recent historical precedent anecdotes. And so we come out of the Cold War and, you know, Americans very optimistic, maybe hoping for a peace dividend, feeling like international war is kind of hopefully gone by the wayside. Of course, there's some rude wake up calls about that in the nineties with the breakup of, you know, Yugoslavia and, you know, these various issues. But what do you have in that period for Clinton? You have Somalia in particular. 
Um, and so that's in a, in a time in which, you know, the early intervention helps to save lives from, you know, what was a humanitarian crisis due to starvation. But then the latter stages, when they try to then kind of nation build, try to go after some of the warlords, et cetera, you know, leads to 18 Americans being killed, some being dragged through the streets and the U.S. getting the heck out of Somalia. And to be clear, there was... Um, some jihadi individuals who were there that we kind of learned subsequently who helped with some of, I believe, the programming of the RPGs and things of that nature. So like there were some nascent parts of Al Qaeda um, around there at the time. And so I think Clinton took that lesson and felt like, look, doing another thing like when bin Laden's in Sudan, like, are we going to go into Sudan, which is an even more, you know, strong functioning government that's hosting him than Somalia was? Uh, Somalia, again, not hosting Bin Laden, but in terms of, like, going after warlord like Adid, like, what's that going to look like? You know, Black Hawk Down and that whole experience was a real negative for Clinton in terms of popular support. I can tell you this, living in America in the 90s, people weren't sitting here being like, why isn't Clinton getting Bin Laden? You know, it was kind of seen as a sideshow. Um, my senior year at, at Williams College, when I was taking this class on international relations, terrorism wasn't even on the syllabus. And I actually remember my professor, who's a great professor, asked the students the first week, it was like, hey, are there any topics that are on here, not on here that we think we should study? And actually some student raised his hand was like, you know, what about terrorism? People were like, eh, you know, it's kind of a thing. Obviously they were like, there was attacks in 98 at the embassies and there was the USS Cole, but it still just didn't seem like the centralized thing that it does today and certainly did in 9-11. So, you know, I don't think it was just the policymaking and intelligence communities that had to be woken up to how serious this was because they had some sense of it. And again, you had people like Richard Clark or others who were really banging the drum on this, but I think the American people weren't clamoring for it. And so the stuff that Clinton did, you know, pressuring Sudan to expel bin Laden, launching the cruise missile strikes, et cetera, like those to many people seem commensurate, although there was some criticism at the time that this was ineffectual, but I'll also say this, the technology wasn't the same, right? There, were, there was this story about how they had Bin Laden on the camera of a drone, but at that point, drones weren't armed. And so all that meant was they was on the drone and then they would have to go and radio into, you know, ships off the coast and then launch cruise missiles. And that takes multiple hours. Whereas in the aftermath of 9-11, it's like, boom, we put Hellfire missiles on Predator drones and now you can see a target and take it out. And then we answer the error that we're in now. But some of the technology that made this stuff easier to achieve was not there at the time. And a lot of it came about because now the threat was seen as much more significant. So, you know, I think 9-11 also, by the way, you know, it's an outlier still to this day in terms of terrorist attacks. And the reason being that it's just usually difficult for a group to get that level of destructive capability. And the reason that they were able to do so, right, was because they were able to take pre-existing technology and come up with, unfortunately, um, you know, a very destructive plan to use that technology against the United States. And, you know, people had advocated for reinforced cockpit doors and things of that nature for a long time before and hadn't gotten it. But that simple change probably would have prevented something like that from happening. So um, it's a tough thing, whereas on the one hand, you want to destroy the organization. On the other hand, yeah, there was this failure of imagination that something that serious could happen. And so everything's a cost benefit choice. And the choices that President Clinton was making at the time faced some criticism. But again, it wasn't something that most people were clamoring to go after Al Qaeda because they were this massive threat that people thought we were going to deal with for the next couple of decades. Great. Uh, it's great. And it's just good information there. And, you know, and again, this is, this has been great. We appreciate having you on. So I just have a few more questions as we finish up um, just, just more about kind of looking forward as we've you know, sort of talked about the rear view mirror, just sort of looking about, uh, you know, the possibilities of, of, of what's at. So I think the first concern that's on a lot of people's minds and you, and you touched on this a little bit is, is the likelihood that, you know, that this situation is going to be very similar, if not the same to, you know, unfortunately, hopefully not, uh, to what happened when President Obama, you know, nine years ago decided to take all the troops out of Iraq, you know, insurgency uh, went through the roof, ISIS came on the scene, and the, the, the U.S. and a coalition had to return uh, to, to Iraq to, to, to stamp out ISIS. What, what are the odds that, you know, the Afghanistan could go the same way? The U.S. leaves the last helicopter, dusts off, and then uh, the Taliban, uh, ISIS, uh, other groups that are there, um, kind of make things go the way of Iraq. I mean, what, what, how likely is that scenario? Because a lot of people are afraid that, you know, what happened in Iraq and happened in Afghanistan and we'll be back before you know it. So look, there's unique, there's unique circumstances in any scenario, but I do think it's valuable to think about some past historical examples. And, you know, there's a couple, the ones that you could point to if you think things are going to go in a negative way, certainly Iraq is one. Obviously you kind of also raised the 
the vision of, of Vietnam, which is the most similar one from the U.S. experience in terms of, you know, a civil war that the U.S. fought in for a very long time, um, lost a number of lives, and then obviously even many more lives from the country in which the United States was operating. Um, and then in the aftermath of U.S. withdrawal, very quickly, the government the U.S. was supporting was toppled. And, um, you know, that was very difficult to watch. But then also you have a lot of people at risk who had worked with the United States. You know, it's one of the reasons the United States took in large numbers of Vietnamese refugees, but also many were not able to be taken in or were, were rejected in that sense. So that's honestly also going to be a potential issue going forward is what the U.S. is going to do if there are significant numbers of Afghan refugees from a, a Taliban takeover, especially ones who work with the U.S., will they be allowed in the country, you know, amidst COVID, all these other stuff. Like, separate issues, but important stuff to think about. But I'll also say this, when the Soviets left, um, the, first of all, the Taliban wasn't around until a little bit later, but all the various kind of anti-Soviet Mujahideen felt like, all right, we're gonna topple the Najibullah government like that. And that didn't happen. Um, it took a number of years. Now, eventually they did, but it was not instantaneous. And then the groups who were fighting against them kind of got control of the country, but then quickly because they were corrupt and divided, they're the ones who basically got rolled by the Taliban in subsequent years. So I think that, you know, clearly there aren't significant insurgent groups on the horizon beyond the Taliban. So it's a little different scenario. It's not this like conglomeration of six or seven different warlords, although the Taliban itself is not unitary for sure. Um, but yeah, I think that the likelihood of the Taliban increasing its power inside of the country is, I think the odds of that are pretty good. Whether the Taliban is either desirous or able to control the entire country, I think is a much more open question. Uh, number one, I think the Taliban may be recognized as kind of similar to learning the lessons about supporting Al Qaeda and ISIS, that if they take over the whole country again and run it like they did before, you know, the significant amount of international economic aid and other issues would, would pretty much disappear. And so, you know, maybe they're going to do what they've been doing, which is building on the drug trade or things of this nature, which they previously said that they um, did not support, but now have been making a lot of money on. But at the end of the day, I'm not sure if that's what they want. So the Taliban may well want to gain more control in places like Kandahar and other parts of the country, get some type of pacted but not final deal with the government, consolidate power, and then kind of, you know, build over time as opposed to like a mad rush to Kabul and just, you know, topple the government as quickly as possible and gain full control. But, you know, I can't, I can't fully predict there. I'll just say that with the U.S., and again, not just the U.S., the U.S. has about 3,000 soldiers in Afghanistan right now. There's 7,000 soldiers from Europe and other countries there. So it's, you know, it's a significant force combined. When they all go, and they all are going to go if the U.S. goes, um, that's when we'll really see. And I think that the Taliban will improve its standing, but whether they'll take over the whole country or not, I'm not sure. Um, and whether the Ghani Afghan government will try to make a deal with them as opposed to just you know, fight them also remains to be seen. But there have been attempts at negotiations. They haven't really gone anywhere. The Taliban is certainly kind of waiting for the US international forces to leave before they bargain in earnest, but that bargain may well be hey, you need to kind of step down and let us come to power or, you know, some more significant power sharing. So um, we'll see. But like, like the people who are, you know, oppose this withdrawal, um, I'm very concerned, although I think ultimately it's the right move, even though uh, it's, a, it's a challenge. And I think that this is the challenge of international politics. Um, the United States certainly bears res some responsibility and, and a burden for launching this conflict and the aftermath of it. But it's also true that international politics is a dirty business. And what I mean by that is a country has finite resources and can't and shouldn't be occupying foreign states you know, forever. Um, and so in the broad sense, even though a civil war might erupt, I don't think it's the United States' job to go and intervene in every single civil conflict in the world and make it right. Number one, that's impossible. Uh, and US presence doesn't always make things better. And number two, we don't have the resources to do that, nor do I think that's the US's role, and nor do other countries necessarily think it's the US role. So could these things happen? Absolutely. Um, is that tragic? It is. Should the US and its allies do you know, things that they can to assuage that or help people in those scenarios? Absolutely. Um, but ultimately, I do think it's, it's the right move, given the amount of time that's passed and uh, the current situation in the country. Uh, my final question uh, is just, you know, a big picture, I, I guess, what does this uh, this, this decision, this transition, this, this decision that after 20 years, uh, it, it's time to go uh, indicate if, if, or, you know, symbolize, if anything, you know, if at all for, you know, perhaps broader changes in American mil military policy going forward. I know you spoke earlier about perhaps shifting priorities to other 
uh, areas of the world that, that represent more of a threat. And then the flip side of this is for the Afghani people who have suffered as much, if not more than anybody uh, in, in, in this conflict. Uh, and it's been said time and time again by President Biden and others that the Afghani people need to decide uh, their own future. I, I, I guess what what's ahead, I guess, both for the U.S. in terms of its policy and in the Afghani people for, um, you know, their attitudes about how they like to see their country going forward? Yeah, so I just had a discussion at the Boston College Model United Nations with uh, Professor Bob Ross, who's also my department, who's a China expert. And we talked about this broader, you know, shift in priorities and resources from the Middle East to East Asia, which honestly began under Obama with this talk of the pivot to Asia, um, and then was somewhat continued under Trump. And now, you know, Biden is pushing even more into. But yeah, this basic idea that, look, is, is terrorist attacks emerging from a certain part of the world concerning the U.S.? Yes. Does the U.S. have an interest in um, having a stable, peaceful Middle East? Yes. Does the U.S. have an interest in um, free flow of oil out of the region? Yes. But are those things as significant and as threatened as, you know, having nuclear armed aggressive rising powers like China and what they're doing in the South China Sea or with Taiwan or otherwise, like from many US policymakers uh, perspective, no. And so I think that this withdrawal from Afghanistan by the Biden administration is both a, you know, individualized context dependent decision for Afghanistan, but as you say, also fits this broader um, shift from focusing resources and attention on the Middle East to East Asia and potentially also to Eastern Europe with Russia uh, and NATO. So I think that it fits that pattern. And I think that many Americans probably support that in part because they're very war weary um, and weary of US involvement in the Middle East, either because they feel like it hasn't achieved much. There are obviously a lot of Americans who think it's not right or just for the US to be involved in the internal affairs of Middle Eastern countries anyway, and see that as you know ineffectual or problematic. So yeah, I think that that's the first point. And then on your broader point about what's gonna happen for the future of Afghanistan, I mean, I've never traveled to the country. I, I've spent a lot of time doing field research and interacting with and living and interviewing people in the Middle East, but you know, more around um, the Levant, uh, not around kind of you know, Central Asia. So I can't claim to be a, an expert on the domestic politics of Afghanistan. Uh, but I'll say this in terms of, you know, I actually have I had some Afghan relatives. I do have uh, friends who live in the country and I do have, you know, talked to some people on the ground there and I look at some of the polling, et cetera. You know, I think a lot of what the people in Afghanistan want is not that different from what people in America elsewhere want, right? They want a stable life. They can make a good future for their children. They can have good schooling, good jobs, those types of things. Obviously, as you say, they've dealt with a much worse situation than almost any country in the world over the past couple of decades and generations. So I think that there hasn't necessarily been massive happiness over the past five or 10 years in Afghanistan because there's a lot of corruption problems. There's been this ongoing insurgency, but for some people, maybe there's been a little more of a breath of fresh air in a sense of that things could get better, but I think we're entering a dark time. And um, you know, when you say things and people say things like, well, the Afghan people will decide their future, it's not just gonna be at the ballot box. Um, it's probably gonna be at the battlefield and at the bargaining table um, and these are very difficult things that any country is dealing with when they're having an ongoing civil war or they're coming out of a massive foreign occupation that then's gonna leave and change the balance of forces on the ground. So there's gonna be a rejiggering of you know, the politics of the country. Um, I don't think anyone has any illusions that it's not gonna be bloody, that it's not gonna be destabilizing, that there's gonna be some economic problems. Um, but if I'm putting an optimistic spin on it, I hope that even these regional actors like Pakistan that support and have supported the Taliban recognize that they want to have you know, economic stability in Afghanistan and that that's in their interest. And hopefully they recognize the type of stability, quote unquote, that the Taliban was pushing in the 90s with you know, terrible you know, punishments and basically taking half the population, not letting them join the workforce, that those things are not the future of Afghanistan. And so whatever those regional partners can do to help push those outcomes, um, I think that hopefully that leads to a better future for the Afghan people, even though you know, they've dealt with a lot um, over the past decades, and that's understating it. Right, and you know we we, we can only hope, and uh, it's a lot, lot of a lot of stuff here. Important topics, important things to think about, and uh, you know going forward, we'll uh, you know have to have to keep an eye on this topic. And we thank you, Professor Kroos, a lot for coming on today to discuss this with us. And uh, you know again, we'll have to see you know going forward this year and in the years ahead uh, what 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 happens to this region and 
and uh, what that means for, for us here and for the rest of the world. So, Professor, thank you again uh, for coming on. This has been the Just Law Podcast. I'm your host, Tom Blakely, here discussing uh, President Biden's decision to withdraw from Afghanistan and uh, some of the history and implications uh, here today. And uh, other than that, next until next time, that's going to do for this episode. Uh, so thanks to everybody for tuning in.